I always like to start my, my talks by kind of giving a little background about myself just as a researcher. Um, you know, I liked a recurring research theme in, in my, my research group, as well as like the stuff I do at Microsoft is to take modern computational approaches and develop theory that enable their interpretations to be related back to classic genomic principles. So, so in, what I like to say is that I'm not a statistician that just builds really fancy hammers and go look for nails. Like I actually really care about biological problems and the methods that we build are, are made specifically to answer these specific questions. So, um, in my weird research program, what I like to do is think about this idea of modeling variation across complex traits. And so this can stem from anything I'm about to talk about today in statistical genetics, um, phenotypes in, in cancer genomics, as well as a little bit of, I do a little shapes and imaging type work as well. Um, and when I say variation, you can think about this as, uh, you know, the different phylogeny of, of, of bird beaks on the left or the different structures of heel bones from primates on the right. Um, and we, we do a lot of things with variable selection, whether that be in the context of association mapping and statistical genetics or, or this weird stuff that we do, which I'll kind of touch on in the end, which is association mapping on like 3D surfaces and structures. Um, but the overall arching theme of this work is this idea of dissecting phenotypic variation. So what I, what I mean by that is I think about phenotypic variation as being like an entire pie, right? You're, you have some trait, that trait has some 100% of that variation across some subset of individuals. What I can do is I can take that, that phenotypic variance and break it up into two different pieces, right? There's a genetic component of that, something that's driving that trait, and there's like an environmental component to that as well, right? Now, what you can do is you can take that genetic piece of that pie and then break it up into different types of effects that might be uh, contributing to the broad sense heritability of a trait, right? Um, and that could be an additive effect, so this idea of gene A's effect plus gene B, and that could be like a nonlinear component as well, right? Gene A times gene B and that effect driving the phenotypic variation of the trait. Um, my, my research program is my, mainly centered around this idea of studying what we call epistasis or this idea of the gene by gene interactions, but you can easily think about that nonlinear component as also being a huge thing of that gene by E component being a huge uh, driver of uh, variation across phenotypes for different individuals, particularly going back to that idea of the, the figure that Jerry showed of the different uh, predictions that happen of different ancestral populations uh, when the model is trained on someone of European ancestry and predicting on someone of African ancestry, you can think about G by E potentially playing a huge role also in the different uh, architectural difference between traits of individuals. And so the data that I, that I think about um, a lot are, you know, in a very simplistic way is this idea of I have some trait Y, you can think about this as like a, a, a continuous vector. Um, this could be crop yield, uh, this could be height for individual uh, for human beings. And we have some genotypic matrix, right? So this X matrix typically of high dimensions, you have in individuals, P variants, our, our, our features here are gonna be SNPs, uh, typically encoded as zero, one, and two uh, uh, based on minor allele frequency. Um, and you think about this being a really high dimensional setting, right? So we really work in settings where like, like the UK Biobank will have 500,000 individuals, millions of variants, and we want to kind of understand association between them. Okay. Now, on any of the models that I'm going to present today, you can also, you don't have to think about this in strictly uh, statistical genetics, but you can also think about this in genomics, for instance, right? So the X can be a, a, a gene expression or something like that as well. Um, so a lot of things we're going to do are, are, are really uh, transferable to different uh, application areas. In statistical genetics, um, you know, there's a huge thing of this idea of linear models being used for trait mapping, right? And I, uh, Jerry kind of touched on this a little bit, right? Um, going back to STAT 101, right? I have my phenotype of interest. I have my genotype matrix. I have this beta vector. Um, and then we have some, some noise. And the reason I like to show this um, this, uh, this slide a lot is because that beta is a really important term here that, that kind of separates a lot of things that we do in uh, genetics from other fields, where beta kind of lends some notion of evidence of association for, for some locus J, right? Um, this idea of like testing against like a null hypothesis, right? I have this, I, once I have these betas, I can then go downstream and do uh, hypothesis testing, derive p-values for then further study uh, uh, downstream, right? Um, and so those betas lend a notion of interpretability. Right. And whatever I do with those betas, I can do things like plot. Uh, once I derive p values, I can derive things like detecting associated loci with a given uh, phenotype of interest. Here on the left hand side, we have a Manhattan plot um, where we have 22 chromosomes for individuals on the, on the bottom. Um, and then we have uh, our negative log transform p values along the y axis. Uh, 
And a spike in this plot means there's like an enrichment in that given genomic location, right? So here we have um, an autoimmune disease. So there's a huge spike in this HLA region. What's really nice about this is you can see enrichments across the genome, um, but you can also then zoom in to different genomic locations and identify maybe which genes are encoding for a given region, right? So associate not only just the variants that are involved maybe with a trait, but maybe the genes that they also are in the uh, regulatory region of that also might be associated with that given trait, right? So this idea of like association mapping. You know, we can get more sophisticated with this and think about how to maybe model multiple traits at a time. So this is kind of the things I've been thinking about now is like how to not just model one trait in isolation, but many traits at a given time. But then again, always coming back to this idea that I have some effect size variable for which I can then do downstream uh, uh, variable selection type techniques like, uh, like Jerry was talking so nicely about in the primary. Now, my group does a little bit things a little bit differently. We don't really focus on linear models. We focus on machine learning and, and nonlinear models to model uh, uh, genetic architecture and complex traits. Um, so as many of us know, machine learning methods have been shown to be well suited for prediction tasks. Um, the, the problem with them is a lot of spaces, particularly in this idea of um, testing against a null hypothesis, and doing classical variable selection, black box methods are often referred to as, or statistical machine learning methods are also referred to as black boxes, right? This is the idea that like I have some input variable that goes into that black box, outspits some really nice prediction, but you really have no idea how the machine learning algorithm is upweighting or downweighting these variants in order to make these really nice predictions, right? This idea of interpretability is not necessarily there from that context, right? And so my research goal is to provide interpretable ways to summarize the importance of input variables for non-parametric methodologies, broadly speaking, right? And I'm really driven by this idea that my input variables are genotypes and my output variables are phenotypes, right? And so to kind of take a step back, you know, going back to my idea of my entire pie, you know, linear models, while they have interpretability, they don't necessarily see the entire picture, right? They can only model, you know, up to some order of, of, of nonlinear effects. But mostly they just focus on additive effects. They kind of miss this idea of the broad sense heritability piece I was kind of talking about. While on the black right-hand side, black box models can really take care of, you know, look at the entire uh, notion of all this variance. However, it doesn't necessarily have the same kind of interpretability that linear models get, right? So my research program is about is about doing working with models that are able to give us the ability to see the entire piece of the pie, but still giving the interpretability that we would get on the left-hand side, right? And that's that's kind of the, the, the notion of a, a huge part of our research program. Uh, to, to kind of take a step, another step back, you know, the conventional wisdom in statistics is Smooth nonlinear functions are often more predictive than linear functions. However, variable selection is easier in linear regression. Um, the conventional wisdom, if I took that sentence and rephrase it for uh, someone in statistical genetics, would be that nonlinear models are typically better for things like genomic selection or phenotypic prediction, but linear models are much better suited for things like GWAS and EQTL mapping. Right? And so if I think about the components of an interpretable model, like what do I even need for my model to be? actually interpretable, I think about it having three ingredients, okay? There's some motivating probabilistic model that's involved. Um, there's a notion of an effect size for all of my input variables. So each of my SNPs or my weight or my features will have some weight associated with it, like a regression coefficient. But the third piece of it is that there's also a statistical metric that allows me to summarize my marker significance, right? Which markers are weighted more uh, as being more important than others, right? In the context of, uh, with respect to like some null hypothesis, right? Like what do I expect to happen in the, se in the setting where there is no signal, right? And so I'll kind of go over uh, this in, in two stages of how I think about how to build nonlinear methods that kind of achieve those three ingredients, right? Now, the first is from a post hoc approach, which is quite uh, common in, in machine learning uh, literature, which is, um, you know, I'm going to fit an, an, a nonlinear model, then I'm going to try to understand what that model learned after I, after I fit it, right? So I'm going to define something that I call an effect size analog for nonlinear models. I'm going to show you how a, a, a method that we came up with to define significance for those effect size analogs, and I'll show you how this works in simulations and real data. Um, and then in part two, I'm going to take another approach to this idea of incorporating interpretability, where I'm going to actually use all the laws of biology or what we know to be true in biology to govern what I'm going to consider to be interpretable. So I'm going to have a model that's kind of governed by things that we think might happen in practice or in, or in data and allow that, uh, enforce my model to only learn things kind of around those rules. 
And so we're, we're, I'll introduce this idea of biologically annotated neural networks. Um, I'll talk about how we fit these models in practice. And again, I'll show you some uh, simulation studies and, and some method comparisons there. Um, so, so the first thing is about this idea of the post hoc strategy. Now, again, going back to nonlinear methods, what do I kind of mean by nonlinear models? So instead of having this restricted X beta relationship, like I showed in that first slide, let's kind of relax that assumption a little bit. And let's assume that my, my phenotype Y is related to my genotype X, but in some nonlinear way. And we'll call this function F of X, right? Um, now, if I want to be very non-parametric about it, what I can do is I can say, I'm going to specify some Gaussian process over that space of functions, right? Where M is my mean function, we'll just, for the context of this talk, let's set that to be zero. But the, everything that I really want to focus on is the idea of the K. The K is going to really, uh, that covariance uh, function is really going to drive the non-linearity of, of this model, right? A common thing to choose here is what we call a Gaussian kernel function at the bottom. Actually, really coolly, if you actually uh, write out the Taylor series expansion of the Gaussian kernel function, you can actually show that you're actually encoding um, all non-linear interactions between uh, variables in your data set. Um, and so you can think about this k-covariance matrix as like a non-linear GRM in a way where you're relating the genotypes of all the individuals in your data set according to some non-linear function k. Okay. Now, what's really cool about these models is um, I get really nice predictions, right? So we have this idea called the kernel trick, right? Where uh, I have some high dimensional input space P, you know, right? P is the dimension of my SNP, so it's gonna be millions. What I'll do is I'll define my kernel function K and that'll take me to this n-dimensional function space, um, this n by n of a function space where I can do really nice predictions, right? Uh, all of my machine learning and non-parametric methodologies kind of live in this, in this domain, right? Now, the issue with this is even though I could do really nice predictions on the right-hand side, if I, in biology, we really want to know is not only the, how, what predictions are, are uh, how I'm getting really good predictions, but what SNPs are contributing to those predictions, right? I think Jerry just mentioned that explicitly in this, in the primer, right? So how do I, in, effectively, there's no way for me once I work in function space to then go back and understand what that meant in terms of the context of my SNPs, which is actually really important in a lot of our applications. So what this means methodologically is the downside is the classical idea of variable selection is, is lost in these models, okay? So I spent a lot of time thinking about how to, how to uh, um, get around these issues. And, and one thing that we came up with is, you know, I have a motivating probabilistic model, but I want some notion of effect size for my input variables once I fit my nonlinear method. So we came to this idea called the effect size analog. Um, and so let's just go back to, to stat 101 really quick, which is the, a class that I used to teach at Brown. Um, you know, if I work in linear model space, you know, I have my linear, linear regression and effect size, right, is just taking my response variable and projecting it onto the column space of my data, right? And that gives me this, this uh, if we think about it from ordinary least squares, right, it gives me this nice beta hat. And with these beta hats, I can test for things, uh, uh, I can create z-scores, I can derive p-values, right? And I can do all this kind of interpretability stuff with beta hat. Now we wanna do the exact same thing, but we're gonna juxtapose this with, with nonlinear methods, okay? So a nonlinear model, I'm gonna relax the assumption of this x beta term, now I just have this f. And we're gonna fit this thing called an effect size analog, where instead of projecting y into the column space of x, I'm gonna project my nonlinear smooth function f onto the column space of x. And that's going to give me this beta tilde, and I can derive this projection function to be whatever I want. But let's, for the sake of the of, of comparison here, let's just assume that it's the same kind of uh, um, generalized inverse that we use in least squares. And I have a beta tilde that can now function very similarly to the way I had in my, for my beta hats, right? Now, they, these aren't exactly the same. Beta tilde is not going to equal exactly beta hat, um, but you can use these beta tildes in a very similar way, okay? So let me kind of show you how this might work um, in, in theory. So I'm from, I got my PhD at Duke. I'm inherently a Bayesian, uh, if that didn't come off before. <laughs> um, so let's assume I have some like MCMC sampling scheme uh, where, uh, you know, I, I set up my, my um, algorithm. I sample uh, from a posterior, conditional posterior for F. I sample from the posterior condition, uh, conditional for tau. And then if I have a projection function that I've set myself, I can deterministically resample these beta tildes for each of my input variables, right? So every time I learn a new F, I can also learn a new beta tilde, which beta tilde then describes uh, some weighting for my input variables for my SNPs, right? 
what I could do with these beta tildes or anything I could do with other, uh, with other models, right? I could take these beta tildes, fit posterior predictors and do predictions with them uh, for out of sample uh, methods. Um, I, can, I can start to work with them in very similar ways that I do with these weights, right? So what's really cool is that these beta tildes gonna give me this notion of effect size. What's not great about them, going back to my checklist, is they don't naturally give me this idea of how to summarize marker significance. Right. So the downside of these beta tildes is I don't naturally get a p value like I do in least squares. Right. I don't naturally get a base factor or an inclusion probability. I don't get these kind of things for which I can summarize. So we have to take an additional step to figure out how we might then rank the importance of these variables. Because as we know, we can't just take the absolute value of these things like we might do in a lasso or something and rank them that they don't necessarily translate in the exact same way. So we have to get a little bit more creative. So we came up, a way, we came up with a way to um, uh, rank variables in kind of like a network type way. And, and just stick with me a little bit. We're going to take a little bit of step away from uh, genetics for a little bit. And let's just think about uh, uh, an illustration using sports, right? So let's say we have a basketball team, all right? And this basketball team as a group, as a collective, has a set of information, right? There's a, there, you can just treat them as a network, right? With that basketball team collected together, the full team has some kind of network, all right? Now, what I can do is I can say, I wanna now figure out which player is most important to this network. Now, let's take number 30 there. He's standing on the second row in the top left. Let's say I put him on injury reserve. So number 30 is no longer playing. And I wanna see how much information about my network, about my team is lost without that player being around. Well, I can compute that, right? And then let's see how much information is lost conditioned on number 30 not being around, okay? I may not lose that much. I may lose some information, but not that much, right? Let's say I take another player, anybody, and let's say he's, he's not around anymore because he goes and decides he wants to play baseball a little bit, shoot Space Jam, he's not gonna play basketball for a long time. Now, without that individual not on the team, I might lose a lot more information without that player being around, right? And I could do this iteratively for every single player on the team and figure out what is the almost this idea of distance or information loss with the full team being intact versus that individual player, uh, what that team, what would that team look like with that individual player's effect being set to zero, right? Let's go back to this idea of genetics. We can kind of quantify this idea in a gene network using KL divergences, right? So one way to summarize the influence of a variant on the rest of the data set is just to kind of study the KL divergence between the full distribution with that, with that SNP being around and a conditional distribution with that SNP's effect being set to zero, right? Now, here the KL divergences can be interpreted as um, if the KL is equal to zero, I mean, those two distributions are exactly the same. That can be interpreted as that variable is not a key explanatory variable relative to the other ones, right? I don't lose any information without that, that SNP being in the network, right? Um, alternatively, you could say the KL divergence is zero if and only if those two things are equal, okay? Now, I was really harping on this idea of a null hypothesis, so stick with me. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. What we do with the KL divergences, because it's on a scale of zero to uh, infinity, is we, uh, we scale them by the sum of all the variables. And we call this a relative centrality measure, right? So that the sum of these rate values all sum to one, right? This creates a really nice null hypothesis for our model. What rate's null hypothesis is, is that all of my players are bench players, right? It's the idea that like no one in my, on my team is more important than the others, right? The alternative hypothesis is that some variables are much more important than others, okay? So let me kind of show you how this works in, in practice, right? Um, so let's say I have a data set. I'm gonna simulate a random data set. I'm gonna have 2000 samples, 25 genetic markers, um, we're going to specify that my last three, the 23, 24, and 25 are going to be causal, okay? Those are going to be my Jordan, Pippin, and Rodman. Um, and then we're going to uh, simulate some effects. We're going to, this is going to be a blown out thing. Um, please don't think this is, this is relative of what ge real genetic architecture looks like. This is just for demonstration. We have some like broad sense heritability of 0.6. Those two, those three variables are going to have marginal effects as well as some interactions between them. And I'm going to fit a GP on this model and then show how rate kind of, um, ranks these variables, just so you can see how this kind of works. And I'm gonna demonstrate what I mean by relative centrality, okay? So I run my GP, I derive my effect size analogs, I then fit rate, and here's what this kind of thing looks like. You can see that um, on the Y-axis is orient everyone are my rate scores. The X-axis are all each of the 25 variables. 
And you can see that my Jordan Pippen and Robin are, are clearly seen as being the most important players on my, on my team. Okay. Now, what I mean by relative centrality is this idea of, well, what happens if I ran this model or ran rate again, but instead I conditioned on Jordan being out of the game all the time, and then each player iteratively being out with him. So Jordan's out for everything, and then each other player is also out. And then I, and then I rerun rate, what happens? Well, if I do that, what you see is, first of all, Pippen and Robin are still most important but the relative importance of all my other players have gone up, but they've all gone up uniformly. That's like saying I have, I have, I've lost a star on my team. Um, I've lost 40 points a game on average. So those 40 points a game have to be made up. That responsibility is going to fall on all my other noise variables equally. Right. Um, and so all of them get that share that responsibility, but they all kind of hover that red dotted line, which is this idea of like, I have nothing but bench players on my team. Everyone kind of is equally contributing uh, to the variation of, of my trade. Let's do, we do the same thing again. Let's take Jordan out. Let's also hold Pippen out this time. And let's hold, let's do the same process. What you can see is Rodman still the most important player and everyone else is kind of hovering over again or along that line. You can see how we're still kind of treat, uh, trending towards this uniformity. I do the same thing again, hold Rodman out as well with the other two players. And I just have nothing but noise variables and I kind of hover around this line. And so this is the idea of, of, of notioning, you know, what this, uh, uh, this idea of centrality is, is actually trying to get at. Now, let me show you the rest of the results and I'll kind of tell you why this, this approach is not perfect at all. Um, so we could do this again. Let's say I, I hold out another bench. I, I start over. Everyone's back on the, on the court. Let's say I hold out number 30 instead, instead of the other players, you can see in panel B, nothing really changes. I'm still identify the same four players. Um, let's say I generate data from nothing but noise. Like everything is just a noise variable. You can see everyone kind of hovers around this like one over P kind of line. Um, so why is, this, why is this model not perfect? It's not perfect for a lot of reasons, but I'll show you where, where it works sometimes in real data. One is um, the KL divergence doesn't scale great at all with uh, super large variables, right? So if I have like a huge large variable space, it's really hard uh, because the KL divergence needs this inverse to happen a lot. That's like a cubic function that can get really uh, nasty in terms of computation to do it over and over again. Also, this one over P line is not great because obviously as P goes to infinity, um, one over p goes to zero. So then you're going to start accepting all variables as being important. That's also not perfect. So the rate and rates uh, utility kind of hovers around like mid-sized data sets where you can kind of have this kind of thing. And I'll show you an example in GWAS right now. Um, but those are two things to kind of think about before you start implementing this is there are use cases for a method like this. Um, but let me show you where, where it does kind of do something well. Um, so this is an association mapping method in, for mouse data coming from the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics. We have 2,000 related mice, 10,000 SNPs. Um, what I love about this data set, there are 129 different traits, and each trait is broken up to these six broad groups here. Um, the, the really amazing thing is that each of these traits kind of differ in terms of the type of effects that are driving the variation of these traits. Some of these traits are driven by strictly additive effects. Some of these traits are driven by nonlinear effects, environmental uh, cage effects that are happening between mice. So it's a really cool data set to kind of get a diversity across these different uh, phenotypes. Here we're just focused on um, HDL content. And I'm going to compare it to a single SNP test, the, the, the conventional one that, that Jerry had mentioned at the beginning of the, of the talk about how people typically think about um, association mapping in this place. So here on the top, we run it with a GP uh, according to rate. And on the bottom, we're going to have a single SNP test. Again, to orient everyone, this again is a, uh, a Manhattan plot. Um, a star are actually genomic, uh, genom uh, biologically validated regions that we kind of know to be, be true based on uh, wet lab studies. Um, and what you can see is that the, for certain regions, there's nice agreement between the single SNP and um, uh, the GP. But there are other spaces where there actually are nonlinear effects happening. Um, as, as uh, like in chromosome 11 and 12 there, where you can see that signal is kind of muddied uh, for the single SNP type of approach. And so this is, these are kind of cool examples of where you could use maybe a Gaussian process for, for some of these methods. Like I said, this, this approach is not perfect. And the null hypothesis is 
while it exists and you can you can do nice statistical tests with it as we kind of show in the in this corresponding paper which i'll link at the end um it's not as conventional as maybe some of the approaches that that like jerry was talking about at the beginning or that i was talking about the top of linear models right um so so where is this really nice is it kind of tells you what's really nice is that uh it kind of paints a picture where non-additive models could though be of use. So here's a nice um, variance component analysis for all 129 different traits, going back to my pie of how we dissect different uh, phenotypes. Uh, we, we have um, on the rows, we have uh, additive effects only pairwise, third order and common environmental effects across these six groups. Um, what we did is we tried to identify which type of effect was driving the variation of these traits. And as you can see, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of what type of effect is actually dominating uh, the architecture for any given uh, uh, single phenotype, right? So this kind of motivates that maybe you should think about um, the utility of non-additive models uh, when thinking about association type mapping problems, right? But let's see if we can do something a little bit better that might be a little bit more, con that might be able to, uh, uh, also be mirror more non or more conventional uh, highest variable selection type approaches. And so while we can have all three components with the stuff I just shown, let's take another step and see, well, maybe we can think about another way to enforce interpretability in these non-parametric type models. Um, and so this is part two of this idea of using neural network architectures that are governed by biology. Now, I want to acknowledge here that rate can be used for non-parametric methods. And this is really cool work that's been done by uh, Pinar, who's a previous student at Brown, Wei, who's be graduating and will be starting work at Facebook soon, and, and Hugh, who's at UChicago, who was at Microsoft Research Group. So rate could be used in, in basic non-parametric uh, models or not Gaussian processes. It could be used in neural networks. So here we have a fully connected neural network, right? I have my input layer. I have some hidden layer, which are, which are governed or, or uh, are defined by some activation functions, right? They're just, they take in as a linear combination, X and its, uh, its weights, um, and then use a non-linear activation function to define my hidden nodes. Um, and then my output layer is then just the hidden layer with a linear combination of its corresponding weights, right? And so I can rewrite this model as like a non-linear hierarchical model if I wanted to, right? Y is just like some transformation of F. But again, if I thought about F as being a function, I could also fit rate type models over F, right? But one thing that this had me thinking about is that it's really, what's really special about biology is kind of like the hierarchical nature of, of a lot of the analyses that we do, right? So there's a hierarchical nature to enrichment studies, right? So again, let's, let's take a, another step of look at this uh, Manhattan plot, which I'm sure you're tired of looking at now. Here we have uh, posterior inclusion probabilities on the y-axis that are scaling from zero to one. Um, each point here is going to be a SNP, okay? And they're going to be color-coded uh, based on uh, a previous study, which, uh, which we did, which is identified, previous identified loci and then uh, novel ones. What's really cool, again, as I was mentioning at the beginning, is each of these SNPs can be annotated for a given gene, right? I know the genomic position of these SNPs, and I know which gene might encode that given region, right? So if I think about a lot of context in biology, right, I have this setting where I know where genes are, I know what chromosomes they 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 uh, they can be lo they're located on, and I know I also know in terms of their regulatory regions, right? The start and end positions for given genes, right? Give or give or take, depending on how you want to define them, right? And what's also really cool is I know which SNPs fall within uh, those windows, right? So I have this really nice idea where I can use, you know, predefined gene list or annotation pathways, and maybe use that information to inform what my network architecture might be, right? So so stay with me a little bit. On the bottom again, we have a Manhattan plot, right? Right. Each SNP here is leading to one of those red dots, which is a gene. As you kind of see. So I have this kind of feeder system of SNPs leading into genes, and then genes maybe leading into pathways. If I took this plot and flipped it on its axis, it sort of looks like a partially connected neural network, right? In the sense of like, if I just connected hidden neurons based on the annotations for which I know SNPs are connected to genes, that kind of gives me a really nice interpretability for my entire model. So my input layer will be how will be all of my variants, and the hidden layer will be 
the interpretation of a node will only be uh, these SNPs enco are encoded for the same gene. So that gives me a nice interpretation where my, my hidden layer is not just a hidden layer, it's my gene layer. All of my nodes are basically representing this idea of a given gene, right? And then I can have my phenotype output layer that I want, right? And this is the idea of biologically annotated neural networks, right? You just impose some architecture based on some biological annotations, right? And that's what created bands. So bands for individual data is I have some general SNP sets. I have the chromosomes for those SNP sets. I know the starting in positions for those, uh, for those SNP sets. And I know which SNPs fall within the regions of those start and ending positions, right? What I could do from the same color coding perspective, I could say that, okay, these SNPs then are gonna only be connected in the second layer of my network according to that SNP set. And I can follow that rule Again, that gives me my SNP, SNP set, and then phenotype layer, right? Um, what's really cool about this model is now I can start to not only think about interpretability based on like variable selection for my input layer weights, but I can also do it for my hidden layer weights because everything has an interpretation. And if I wanna be Bayesian about it, I can start thinking about, okay, I might think that SNPs might be distributed differently according to different traits, right? So if I think about, uh, SNPs might be on or off if I think I have a sparse architecture. Maybe I have something that's more polygenic, or maybe even if you want to be uh, even more so about it, maybe omnigenic, where you have different types of effects happening, right? I can start to encode my interpretation of what might ha be happening on my SNP and gene layer type of effects based on these priors, right? And then I can model this based as like a nonlinear model, right? So I can specify my model into a full model specification, right? So I can have, so here I have my, my phenotype of interest. That's just a linear combination of my hidden neurons and those weights. For my genes, I can say, I think my genes follow just a sparse prior distribution. Maybe I think my SNPs follow a more complicated distribution. So I might fit a, a, a mixture model for, for those or mixture prior for those. And then I could just model things. I can get posterior inclusion probabilities that'll tell me both uh, which SNPs are most important and which genes are most important in the context of my trait. Um, what's really cool about BAM's framework is it doesn't have to just fit on individual level data. I can also think about fitting this on summary statistics. Uh, so here we have uh, a model where I, I only have access to GWAS summary stats from like a previous study uh, uh, consortium. Um, and so instead of fitting just uh, SNPs to phenotype, I might fit the LD matrix onto like the weights that were derived from a previous study. But same kind of thing, I can still do the same uh, analyses. I can also think about how to model bands with multiple phenotypes, right? So I can take advantage of the fact that multiple traits might have some kind of underlying correlation structure and I can use bands and then learn or, or leverage that correlation structure to better identify SNPs that are, are associated with a given trait, but also SNPs that are associated across traits as well. Um, and so the, the, the thing is really flexible. If you want to be deeper about the way you think about this, you don't have to stop at just like genes. You can think about pathways as well, right? Because pathways are also annotated in a very similar way. I can have a, an additional layer where I say, okay, genes are only going to be uh, encoded for uh, the same node if they occur in the same pathway. And so we could think about how to also uh, lengthen out um, this specification. And so as you can see, the same three components also happen in this bands type model, right? I have a motivating probabilistic model with this Bayesian neural network. There's a notion of effect size for in this idea that like, I have weights that are, that are interpretable for either SNPs or their SNP sets. And then I have posterior inclusion probabilities which would then help me rank and summarize significance uh, for these markers. Um, in our model, we fit this with a variational EM. Um, the really cool thing is that the posterior mean for weights of non-association, non-associated SNPs and SNP sets trend towards zero um, in our training. Um, and the most important part about this, like I've been saying, is this idea of the posterior inclusion probabilities really help us rank our SNPs and SNP sets accordingly for, for further validation and downstream tasks. So really quickly, let me just show you how this works for the simulation study. Um, here, we're gonna take chromosome one of, of individuals of European ancestry from the UK Biobank. Um, here we have 300,000 individuals, um, about uh, 36,000 SNPs on chromosome one. Uh, we'll, we're gonna use a, the RefSeq database in order to annotate each SNP for these given, uh, for genes. And so that'll give us 1900 genes approximately. 
Um, we also think about the, the regular, the um, intergenic regions between those genes is also SNP sets. So that kind of doubles our, the number of SNP sets that we're looking at. Um, we're going to assume the trait heritability for this context of, of these simulations is 0.6. Um, and we will uh, do this 100 times for different simulated data sets. Um, I want to acknowledge that this, that the paper listed at the bottom here, there's like a 70 page supplemental. So there's like all kinds of scenarios. So if you think there are other scenarios you want to see, please feel free to go through uh, that, that lengthy document. Um, but here we looked at, generally speaking, uh, two different architectures, a sparse architecture, which just means that a few SNPs are contributing to the, to the uh, architecture of a trait, and polygenic architectures, which simply means there are many more um, contributing to the architecture of a trait. Very briefly, the reason why polygenic association mapping is harder than sparse is that if you go back to my pi example, if I only have a few SNPs contributing to the architecture of a trait, that's like taking my pie and dipping it up to, to like, let's say 10 slices, right? So each SNP gets a large uh, proportion of that variance. Versus the polygenic architecture, let's say I have 100 SNPs. Now what I've done is I've taken that pie, divided it up into 100 slices. That's a much smaller piece of the pie that each SNP gets. So it's much harder to identify the, the true SNPs of, of interest. So the polygenic trait architecture context is much more difficult. Um, but you can see in the, in the context of these simulations across these different um, state-of-the-art methods, you know, BANS is right up there with as being competitive with both of these type of architectures. Um, what's great about BANS is it doesn't just need to just rank variants, it can also rank genes as well. And so here we can compare BANS to both state-of-the-art SNP level methods as well as gene level methods. Um, and then you can see across these different architectures as well, bands is quite well robustly across these different traits. Um, the one thing that we've been working on the improvement bands is like the runtime and, and the way that we the fit the model for future work. We want, to ex we want the model to be able to extend to much larger data settings. And so that's a, that is something that we've, that we've been doing. I'm also very honest about <laughs> the limitations of the work. BANS is very good at association mapping. There was one thing that Jerry mentioned about prediction. BANS is I don't think BANS is well suited in its current state for like polygenic risk score prediction things. BANS is very well in, in um, identifying or recovering the true uh, weights for simple architectures. So if I have a trait that's purely additive, BANS is very well in estimating um, those, uh, those weights. And so it, out of sample prediction probably will go quite well for those. But as you can see on the x-axis, um, as, I, as I increase the uh, complexity of the architecture I'm setting at, whether I make it additive and epistatic or more polygenic, you can see us under uh, estimating the weights of these models. This is, a, this is a, a byproduct, I think, of the variational algorithm, which is an approximation of the Bayesian um, MCMC. So we're trying an approximate solution for that problem. And so I think that's why you see this, this decrease. But if you wanted to use bands for predictive purposes, I think thinking about alternative uh, algorithmic structures might be, uh, algorithmic strategies might be worth doing, um, just to throw that out there. And I'm happy to answer questions about this. There, I write, we write in the paper very honestly, like where bands is not good. So um, you can also read it there. Um, so just really quickly in real data, um, similar story. Here we take two different things, one from the UK Biobank, one from the Framingham Heart Study. Um, we also look at HDL in both of these groups, just as a association mapping um, uh, analysis. Um, we look at the same 300, 400,000 SNPs in both cases so that we can kind of match our, our, our ability to replicate across these two groups. Sorry um, to interrupt, and, Dr. Lauren. Yeah. We're, we're almost out of time here. If, okay. If you just want to present this example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so this is like our, our basic example. I'm basically finished. Um, future and ongoing work, because anyone's interested, um, we're continuing to work in this interpretability space. We're also thinking about how to use this for non just genetic type of models. So things like cancer genomics um, imaging, which you can see there's like tumors spinning around where we're doing like 3D variable selection with tumors um, on, on different things, which are like things like the Sinatra pro, uh, pipeline and stuff like that with 3D objects. Um, other than that, this has like been a huge collaborative effort across many different groups and people have given us money, which I've been super happy about. Um, here's some papers and I'm happy to take any questions that people have.